Welcome back to World War II TV, folks. And if you're new to the channel and there's been a few new subscribers over the last few days, don't forget all the information you need is in the description below. You'll find links to my social media accounts, the websites and books of my guests and other resources. Sometimes there are complimentary shows you can find on our channel that will support the information being said today. But in today's Canadian-themed show, we are taking to the skies with 429 Bison Heavy Bomber Squadron over Europe. My guest is Gregory Gob Kopchuk, who joins me now from Canada. And again, the links to his book are in the description below. So good afternoon where you are. How are you today, Greg? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. How are you doing? Very well. So we were just chatting before going live, you know, writing about a single unit, be it an army battalion or a squadron, it's always how much detail do you go to, you know, do you do a little thing to reach a big market? Do you just go for all the information there? But before, for the benefit of viewers, how did you get involved in this project? Why and who are you, basically? <laughs> well, I'm nobody special. Uh, I don't have any training as a historian. I wanted to be a historian. My grade 12 history teacher said, oh, don't bother. There's no uh, jobs in being a historian. Um, it was personal interest. My uncle, Flight Sergeant John Kopchuk, was killed on 429 Squadron on 22 June 1943. And it started out as trying to find out what happened to him. It took 12 years to figure out what exactly happened to him. And a lot of it, there's some conjecture put in there. And, uh, you know, I was talking to a lot of the veterans of 429 Squadron, and I thought if I told them I was writing a book, they'd open up more. Um, but that didn't always work. Because, uh, you know, I was trying to find out what happened to my uncle. And I collected all this information about the squadron and then, um, you know, kind of shelved it once I figured out what happened to him. And then guilt got the best of me because <laughs> I said to all these veterans, I would publish a book uh, about the squadron. And um, finally, in August of 2022, uh, we had the book launched down at the Bomber Command Museum of Canada over 20 years in the making. Well, I mean, it's it, that's one of the things that I really enjoy doing is bringing people to my audience who have been working on a project for a long time. There are the best-selling authors that go from book to book, project to project, and they're fantastic books. And we all love them and we read them a lot. But it's the people who have essentially spent a lifetime working on something that I think brings something special because it's that unique connection. As, of course, it is about the aircraft, but it's more, but more than anything else. It's about the people. Um, and that's what we're going to learn about today. So you've come on with a PowerPoint. I'm in charge tonight. So tell me when to move on the slides. And folks, we will do questions as we go along today. So if you want to ask Greg anything, just far away. And uh, as usual, we'll we'll just sit back and listen to our, our, our guests. So uh, over to you, Greg. Okay. Well, of course, my book, Nothing to Chance. It's actually the motto of 429 Squadron. Um, one of the big things we did online was vote on I had a vote. I said, what photo would be the best one for the cover of the book? And I put about five different ones. And hands down, the one on volume two, with everyone standing on the Lancaster, was the winner. Now, the only problem was 429 Squadron, during World War II, only got their lengths in mid-March 1945. You know, primarily, they flew Wellingtons and Halifaxes. The number two winner was the one you see there on volume one with the Halifax in the background. So um, I vetoed the, the popular vote. <laughs> well, I mean, we love Halifax as well. I mean, Jane did a great show on Halifax bombers well, about a year and a half, two years ago. So um, it's yeah. that same old topic that always comes up. Why are some things talked about more than others? And the fact you ask most people on the street to name a World War II bomber, they'll say Lancaster or Flying Fortress. And then if you say and Halifax and Wellington and even Liberators will be further down the list. But I digress. Um, Back to you. And then there's there's the, the, the release of the book there, the date. Yeah, exactly. And like I said, it's 79 years in the making because my uncle was killed in 1943 and we published in 2022. Uh, that's a picture of my uncle. Now, we didn't know a lot about what happened to him, right? Uh, the family didn't know anything. We knew he was buried in Vlesingen, Holland. And there was a family that from the end of the war till present day, uh, their last name is Tran, has been taking care of, of his grave now for four generations of the family. And the original two were were Nellie and Kaz, and they're the ones holding the little dogs there. Uh, Kaz fought in the Free Polish Army in 
World War II and ended up settling in Holland. And down on the right there, you can see on the extreme right of the photo is their son, uh, Rico. And he started taking care of the grave. And then his, his kids there, we have on the far left, Rico Jr., his wife, Tos, and uh, their daughter. And uh, they've been taking care of the grave and, of course, their children. And when I look back at from my grandfather to my kids is also four generations. So we have four generations wow. on two sides of the ocean that have been connected by the death of this one individual. And none of us knew. Him wow. Personally, right. Wow. So next slide. Um, this is some of his personal effects. Of course, the family had, you know, his memorial cross, his medals, um, and some of his personal belongings. He did keep a diary. He wrote it in Ukrainian, but basically it stops when he reaches Bournemouth in England. So there wasn't a lot of detail again, what happened to him? You know, all we know is the date he was killed and he was buried. So if you want to flip to the next slide, um, these are the graves of the crew that do exist. We didn't even know who was on the crew. So, you know, my uncle is, you know, buried there, Kazimir Orlinsky, James Patrick O'Reilly, and then an unknown is also buried. He's one of the crew members. His body was never positively identified. So, you know, I had taken his medals out every Remembrance Day and polished them up from the time I was about nine or ten. And finally, in 1979, a wee lad of 18, you can flip the screen. Mm -hmm. I sent a letter to the National Archives in Ottawa saying, hey, I'd like to find out more information about him. They sent me a one pager, basically his enlistment date, where he trained, you know, when he graduated, and two important pieces of information. He was posted to 429 Squadron, and he was killed on an op to Krefeld, Germany on 21, 22 June, 1943. So suddenly we have a little more information. And then lo and behold, one year I find out about a magical thing called an operational records book, mm. <laughs> which each squadron kept, which essentially is a diary, lists all the sorties and maybe some additional details. And, uh, you know, um, and of course, what I found out from there was, again, his uh, crew, um, who they were. Uh, what happened to them when they actually got posted into 429 Squadron. And they weren't there very long. They were posted in of, you know, 14 May. They did one op to Wuppertal, and then they were killed on their second op. Now, June was a real, June of 43 was a horrible month for the squadron. Out of 30 Wellington planes and crews that, you know, crashed, failed to return, um, 10 crews were lost in June. Six in uh, basically a 24-hour period because they did an op to Krefeld on the 21st, and then on 22nd, they went to Mannheim. And June, uh, the Krefeld op, they lost four planes in crews, which um, they they, there were several nights later on in the squadron's history where they lost, you know, three planes. You know, uh, we're talking Halifax's, so seven crews, so 21. This was probably their worst night. And one thing that did happen is they were having this uh, Bombs for Britain campaign uh, the week before. And they rolled up a 4,000-pound cookie to the local pub there near Eastmore. And uh, they had an auction in the pub. Uh, and uh, the crew members, the pilots, were bidding on you know, who would carry the 4,000 pound cookie to Krefeld. And of course, you know, the locals bought their stamps and they put their stamps on the bomb. And one of the crew members, uh, Frenchie de Buzak was the winner. And uh, he was the one that was going to take the cookie. Now, so if you skip just to the next slide for a second here, one thing I also found out was a German pilot who shot down my uncle's plane. Wow. Major Kurt Holler, he's also buried in Holland, and that's his grave where I visited. Um, let's go to the next slide. 
So, uh, yeah, let's go back. <laughs> let's go back to the one that shows my there. Yep. So what happened was they had this uh, um, campaign. Frenchie de Buzac, a pilot from bigger Saskatchewan, his, he suddenly got in this bidding frenzy for some reason and wanted to win carrying the cookie. So he did. And But what happened was the night of the op, instead of everyone leaving from the regular dispersals, they lined up all the Wellingtons, how you see here, in a line like this on the unused runway. And every single crew was totally upset with this because it breaks their routine, their karma that they're used to, you know, creates bad, bad vibes, bad juju, right? And the reporters actually came and took photos of the crews before they took off. Um, but the photos were never published because Frenchie Dubuzak and his crew also went down and were killed that night as well. And I tried to see if I could find those photos somewhere in, in Yorkshire and in, in any of the um, newspapers. Couldn't find them. Couldn't find them. So don't know where they ended up. Uh, but, you know, this is so this is essentially the framework that I started with. And uh, so if we skip down to the the uh, the one after this. And we just got a question about I mean, you may be covering this later on, but we'll do it because it's come up there. So is was he shot down by a night fighter? Absolutely. Major Kurt Holler and his board funker, uh, Robert Gotha, uh, came up and, and shot them down at uh, about one twenty in the morning. And then at 1.41 in the morning, uh, Major Kurt Holler was shot down by a six-group bomber. We don't know which one because I couldn't find the actual uh, air combat report. But he was hit, told his board funker, uh, Robert Gotha, to, jump, uh, to you know, jump out of the plane. Robert got caught on the tail fin of their ME-110. He eventually broke loose, but... Uh, Holler died in the crash. He was dead from the, the bullet that hit him. And uh, I found this out as a, as a result. Uh, got to know Peter Spoden, who was a German night fighter pilot. And I found out where Robert Gotha was living. And he arrived there. Robert Gotha, unfortunately, was on his deathbed. His wife gave us a picture of Kurt Holler, but he wouldn't give us a picture of Robert Gotha. Wow. Yeah. So... Uh, and this, this, you know, this is I, I'm going to kind of big up your book now for the viewers, because this is the kind of micro history that I think everyone loves is that, you know, you're saying it all there about what's in this book. And, you know, unless we mind ourselves, this is one squadron uh, of one national, of one nation in one part of the war that, that we you know we think we have a, a, so many World War Two books coming out every year. But actually, there's still so much that's undocumented. We could do this for every regiment, every squadron every ship every every unit and and we we'd have books coming out by the cartload week after week after week but uh, amazing dedication to your project so you start with the, the story of your your family project and then it kind of obviously expanded in all directions from that i guess that's how it worked yeah well exactly what happened was uh 429 squadron is still active in the royal canadian air force out in trenton ontario and in about 1997, 98, I got a hold of the squadron historian officer. And I said, wait, well, hey, my uncle died on the squadron. Do you have any details about him? Uh, and he goes, no, sorry, not much. And I go, do you have a role of honor of the squadron? And he says, well, no, we don't. See, I had spent 10 years in the infantry, served in two different infantry units, and they had everything, Right. So I'm asking the looking for these same things. I go, well, do you have a list of operations they flew? Uh, no, we don't. Uh, do you have a list of all the COs during the wartime and photos? No, we don't. Uh, do you have a list of all the decorations that were awarded to all the personnel in the squadron during the war? Uh, no, we don't. And then I said, uh, well, what do you have about the squadron? And they go, well, not much. And I said, sounds like you have nothing at all. And I hung up the phone, right? I slammed it down. That's before cell phones were invented, of course, because I was quite upset. My uncle had died on the squadron and they didn't even know. Mm. 
you know, at least every regiment, infantry regiment out there had a role of honor with everyone who had died, right? Yeah, at they least one of yep. those. And they didn't have anything. So this really bothered me. So I thought, okay, I'm going to start documenting this. I had the ORB. I thought, you know, I'll be able to figure this out. And I put up my website at 429sqn.ca. And I started posting all this stuff as I, as I got it, uh, you know, and figured it out. And then lo and behold, people started emailing me. My uncle, my father, my grandfather you know, served on the squadron, died on the squadron. Can you give me any more details? And I'm like, wow. And they started coming in. It, it almost got to the point I was researching these people more than uh, what happened to my uncle, right? Um, you know, so I did my best to answer the questions as best I could because I had some information, obviously, that no one else had. So it was quite surprising how many people didn't know anything about their relatives that had served on the squadron either. And if you take a look, if we go to the next yeah. slide, um, you can see the Wellington period was probably the worst period of the squadron during the war. Uh, they started flying ops in January of 43, and then mid-August they stood down to switch over to Halifax's. But out of 395 aircrew killed on the squadron, 119 were killed in eight short months. And when you look at how long they flew Halley's, you know, from August 43 to March 45, they lost 177, you know, in a period that was almost a year and a half, almost two years. And then, of I'm course, big, the crews as well. Yes. You know, so uh, the the hardest part about doing this research for me, of course, was trying to find anyone that served on the Wellington period and actually survived. Because you can see their casualty rate was basically over 100% based on authorized crew strength at the time. Yep. And we're getting a question from Kelly's history. Did they get the Mark III Halifaxes right off the bat? No, the Hel Mark III's came later. They got the uh, the Mark V's, then the Mark II's, and then the Mark III's. So. And Phil, Phil Bosworth is asking how many aircraft lost for those figures? Ah, uh, well, what we're looking at is uh, 30 Wellingtons were lost in total. I think it was uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 50 or 60 Halleys. And only one Lancaster was lost on a wartime op. And then they had a crash of a Lank in uh, November of 45 because they were part of the occupational force. Mm. Um, and they were disbanded at the end of May 46. And I so. bet there's a few people watching this who, if they're being honest with themselves, would be, would, wouldn't would want to think that there are Wellingtons still being used as late as August 43. I think most people subconsciously think of that as, that's 1940. We've moved on from that. And, and they think of the four engines and the heavy bombers. And, you know, it's come up on other World War II TV shows is that you get, uh, more information written about the end of the war than you do the middle of the war, because the people in the middle of the war don't often survive to the end of the war to write about the middle of the war. The aircraft move on, the tanks move on, everything moves on. So you end up with this sort of dearth of information about the middle part, but plenty about the final bits. Is that Was that something you were encountering in the process? Oh, absolutely, because most of the veterans I talked to all served on the squadron, in, you know, mid to late 44. Yeah. You know, because very few actually survived the Wellington period. Uh, the average crew during the Wellington period lasted seven ops. Good grief. Yeah. You know, there was only one crew that was actually screened from operations during the Wellington period. And they were right at the end. That was uh, Sergeant Stu Bruce's crew. And keep in mind also, Bomber Command didn't withdraw the Wellington out of operational service over Northwest Europe until the raid on Hanover on October 8th, 1943 was the last time they actually flew Wellingtons. Hmm. So. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah. Amazing statistics. And the people are already thanking you for their work and they're already asking about going and reading the book. And the next, this next slide of yours, I think, is really interesting because when we talk about 
RCAF squadrons or RAF squadrons or RAAF squadrons, whatever it would be, is that's only part of the story, isn't it? Because very, very few squadrons anywhere in the world are purely one thing. It's there's that, that's kind of how it works, isn't it? We give them a kind of a, a an overall label, but it's not quite how it works. Explain what you know, a Canadian squadron and how. Where, at what point do you become a Canadian squadron? Is it where it's established and who commands it? How, run us through the process. The process. Well, that that's part of the whole whole issue of you know the Canadian squadrons. I mean, uh, four two nine squadron was formed with along with uh, four two seven and four two eight squadron on November seventh forty two as part of the Royal Canadian Air Force. Yeah. Okay, and uh, on November eleventh they formed four three one squadron uh as well in the end they would form 14 bomber squadrons that were part of bomber command now these squadrons that were first formed were put under uh four group a british group commanded by air Vi vice marshal carr who was actually a new zealander and of course both bomber harris and carr uh fought the idea of creating a separate bomber group like the one for canada OK, they didn't want it. They said there were all kinds of reasons why it shouldn't happen. But because we had set up the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan and our prime minister, uh, Mackenzie King, at the time negotiated Article 15, which said we could create a separate and independent air force from the Royal Air Force. Because in the First World War, we recruited people into the Air Force. We sent them overseas to the Royal Flying Corps and lost total track of them and didn't know where they were, where they were posted or anything like that. Uh, so Mackenzie King didn't want the same thing happening this time around. So yes, they were formed as RCAF squadrons. Now, of course, the first CEO of the squadron was British from the Royal Air Force, Wing Commander Owen. And every single one of the squadrons that were formed were basically a British commanding officer to begin with. And right away, they just flooded people into the squadron. So you can see by the end of December 42, only 17% of the squadron is actually Canadian personnel, including ground crew. And so the idea was to get it 100% Canadian. And you can see the only time they ever got to 100% Canadian was 31 March 1946. And they were disbanded at the end of May 46. And they had to send these returns in every two weeks to six group headquarters to say how many Canadians were in the group. And it was broken down by ground crew, enlisted ranks, officers, trades, the whole nine yards. Okay. And no so you, an interesting thing you can see once 429 Squadron ended up in six group on 1 April of 43, suddenly there's more Canadians coming into the squadron, starting with the ending return in April, and then, of course, September. And then, uh, you know, it, it roughly sits at about 80% Canadian all through the war. And one of the big factors that prevented it from being 100% Canadian is most of the flight engineers came from the RAF. Right. So. Brilliant stuff. Should we move on? Yeah, absolutely. And... Uh, you know, let's talk here. This is the first crew that was lost on the squadron is uh, Johnson's crew. He was a New Zealander. Uh, his bomb aimer um, was British and his navigator. They were all R RAF types, of course. Um, now, the interesting thing is Risingham, we could not find a photo of him, found the family, no one in the family had a photo of them. So all these were dug out through uh, personally seeking out the families in England. Um, interesting story about Stuart, who is on the far right here, is he had previously gone missing in 1942 when they were ferrying an aircraft to Gibraltar. They force landed in Portugal and in a letter was sent to his family. You know, he's currently missing. We don't know what happened. We'll let you know as things go on. So when they got the second letter in, in January, uh, you know, of 43, they probably said, oh, don't worry, he'll turn up. 
but of course he didn't. Uh, all five of the crew members were killed. And um, if you want to, and of course, Dimick here, the fellow that's uh, in the color photo, he was married um, be, before he was killed. And I got an interesting story about him if we go to the next slide. Now, let's fast forward to September 7th, 2019. In the middle photo, uh, that's when I went to Halifax on, or no, not Hal Hamilton, Ontario, to ride in uh, the Lancaster bomber there that's at the Canadian Heritage Warplane Museum. Now, the third guy from the right is a fellow Richard Crimmins from England, who came over also to fly in the aircraft. And I said, well, why are you flying in this one? You have a flying one in England. He says it belongs to the queen and she won't let me in it. <laughs> That's what he said. Uh, so I kept in touch with them. And then I said, listen, I'm trying to find two members of the crew that uh, I can't seem to locate. Uh, one was Stewart's family and one was Dimick's family. So, of course, uh, Sergeant Dimick, who was also killed, got married on 2 August of 42. And when he was killed, his wife, Mary, was pregnant with their daughter, Jeanette. So Jeanette was born in May of 43. So Richard eventually finds the family. He finds Jeanette. And lo and behold, Jeanette, his, you know, Dimex's daughter, is living in Hamilton, Ontario. Mm. <laughs> so, so I flew back out to Hamilton, met with Jeanette, who's there on the right with her daughter, Tracy. And she has her little dad box there where she kept all the letters and telegrams, you know, notifications about her father missing in action in his medals and all sorts of little mementos like that about him. And, you know, he was always listed as missing presumed dead because his body was never recovered. And he was she was quite upset when her mother remarried because she said, well, what if dad comes home? You know, mm. and she kept thinking for years that her dad might come home. And of course, she's when I met her, she was 77 years old. And she told me how how that really bothered her all her life, that he was only missing presumed dead. And that's an interesting subject just to go you know, down a potential rabbit hole, Greg, because studying as you have a, a squadron like that is the fates of these individuals are so varied, isn't it? You know, s some never never had an, uh, an accident did all their tour went back home others became prisoners of war others had crashes where the people as you said just disappear without a trace you can come down in the sea you can come down and everything it'd be lost in a fire or a crash or when you when you were running the one well, you're still running the website dealing with family members who don't know information about their loved one that was lost it, it, it you must have had to have given a you know a hundred different answers and, and to a lot of them better say we still don't know is that, I guess that's right, yeah? Oh, absolutely, because they basically have the same kind of letter in the family that my family had, you know, missing, presumed dead, confirmed dead, or, you know, body never found, commemorated on running me memorial. What happened to them, right? And most of the times that's what people are asking, or even, you know, some people are, uh, you know, they're, let's say their father or uncle survived the war. They were like, what did he do? Because I'd like to know, and he never talked about it, mm. right? Okay, next slide. So interesting one here about Sergeant Stewart, who is the air gunner on the first crew lost. Uh, I eventually found his, um, or rather Richard Crimmins helped find her, his niece, Marilyn Ainsworth, who lives in England. And Marilyn Ainsworth, when I told her I was publishing the book and we we're going to launch it, she sent me a check. So she bought the very first copy of the Squadron History. And she had a relative, uh, a distant niece, cousin, Jill uh, Bernard here, who lives in Calgary, who came to pick up the book. And she was also the first person to pick up a copy of the book as well. So it was from the first crew that was lost on the Squadron and all RAF types. Oh. So, you know, it's it's interesting. I've got this personal connection with two of the families who I met from the first crew lost. 
Brilliant. Moving on. And yeah, moving on. Okay. And so the last person killed on 429 Squadron, he wasn't actually killed at the squadron. It's uh, Percy Croswell. Um, he was a POW. He was lost in, um, uh, he was shot down in Dusseldorf in uh, April of uh, 44. And he was in a POW camp. And uh, years ago, I was working on a uh, encyclopedia series uh, written by Ted Byfield about the history of Alberta and Canadians in World War II, which is the volume I was working on. And I was interviewing this fighter pilot, Doug Matheson, who was also, um, you know, a POW. And he was in, involved in this Great March West when they took all the POWs to move them west so that they could be returned to the Allies instead of the Russians. And um, I said, do you remember a, a fellow named Croswell that uh, might have been there in the march with you? He goes, oh, yeah. Yeah, he was shot by a guard, the same guard who shot me through the leg. And he goes, uh, yeah, this guard shot Croswell and killed him. And I says, well, the documentation says, you know, he was killed trying to escape. He goes, no, well, no. He says what happened was, you know, as they were walking along, you know, for weeks, the Germans didn't feed them and they had to scrounge for food. And, and Croswell saw this bush with berries and it was kind of off the track of where they were marching. And, you know, the guard warned him, hey, halt, halt, don't go towards the berries. And and Croswell was just so hungry, he didn't care at that point. And the guard shot him and killed him and said he was trying to escape. Now, fast forward, eventually they get to the west, the western front uh, where the Allied troops are, and they meet up with the Irish guards. And, you know, Doug uh, Matheson again tells the story. You know, one officer comes up to them and says, were there any guards that were particularly rough or mean? Uh, you know, and they all pointed to this guard who killed Croswell and shot Doug Matheson. And he says they took him away. We never saw him again. So we assume they, uh, the Irish guards shot him. Wow. wow. You know, so, you know, these are the little stories you start to find out that you're never going to get in a broad history book, right? It, it's what yeah. makes the squadron personal. And, and, and your struggle must have been, how, when do you stop with the side stories? You know, you could you could elaborate on the Irish guards, you could elaborate on the German guards, elaborate on where this prisoner war camp is. You can start, every story you start with leads you to other stories that could at, at, least, at the very least be a footnote or could be in some ways an entire chapter. So <laughs> knowing when to stop a project like this, that's that's the... The, the, the professional historians who are going to write a book on, let's say, uh, Burma or um, El Alamein, they, they know the remits of their project. And when they finish it, they submit the article. Yours is a life dedication. So I can imagine you've learned stuff about 49 Squadron since the book came out. That you think, oh, God, now that needs to be another volume. It, it never ends, I guess. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, it's like I tell people, you know, if I knew how much work it was writing the book, I never would have done it. It's kind of like having a child. If you know how much work, you know, having a child is, you'd think twice about having kids, right? And yeah. what did it take? About 20 years to do this book about the time it takes to raise a child. And yeah, where do you stop? And that's as I was starting to actually write the book. See, I tried to include little tidbits about every member that was killed and by the I was just finished the Wellington period, and I thought, my God, this is going to take forever. So I had to skip that. You know, so you see more detail in the Wellington period about crew members than you do in the rest of the book. You still hear about stories and stuff, but not as much. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Moving on. Moving on. So one of the big things with the leadership in 429 Squadron, of course, the first CO was RAF. And the two flight commanders um, were both RAF. Now, they were both experienced, the two flight commanders. Uh, they had already done previous tours and other squadrons. Um, Holmes already had a DFC. He was actually a lifer. He had been in um, the RAF since the 1930s. Um, and he had had two crash landings. No, Cairns had had two crash landings 
prior, uh, you know, in other operations. And these were the flight commanders uh, hoping to pass on their experience to all the new crews that were coming in. Um, of course, at the bottom there, uh, interesting note, it's just a raising the RCAF ensign at Eastmore, Yorkshire, where 429 Squadron was formed. And they named the officers in the photo, but they don't name the sergeant who's ra raising the flag. Appleby, the adjutant, is RCAF. Wing Commander Owen, of course, RAF. Squadron Leader Holmes, RAF as well. Now, funny thing, the date of the photo is actually February 3rd, 43. And uh, six group was formed on 1 January, 1943. And the whole caption for this photo says there were, the new, you know, RCAF six group is formed and they're raising the RCAF ensign at uh, Eastmore, Yorkshire. And yet the photo was taken in, in February of 43. So stage for the photographer, of mm. course. So next slide. And if we want to take a look, the leadership of the squadron now, the CEO and the two flight commanders are RAF types, but our bomb leader is a RCAF type. Um, you know, our gunnery leader, again, uh, Canadian, nav leader, Canadian. And uh, one interesting thing you can sh see about every single one of these early members of the squadron, um, they were all shot down. One became a POW, the rest of them were killed including the two flight commanders, right? Now, a big person in the squadron um, who everyone raved about was the Padre, Lowry. And something interesting he did was he kept the Padre's book. He started recording the names of all the air crew and where they were from and next to kin. And whenever possible, he tried to get photos of the crews and put them in this Padres book. So a lot of the scratchy old photos I have, like these three photos are mm -hmm. all from the Padres book. Wow. And if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have had any photos. Of that, that, and that's a fascinating, uh, again, little rabbit hole, because with 100 Group, that is going to be the subject of the Masters of the Air Apple series that's coming out supposedly this year. A lot of the work was done by the, by the, the chaplain there. And it, I wonder whether there's something that connects the recording of the people by chaplains more so than perhaps some other people who are recording maybe aircraft types and mission logs, things like that. But there's the, the, the a, a figure there to, to, to look after souls, I guess, is interested in the people. And so it's, fa it's fascinating how many people I've met who are researching units. Uh, Les there's Leslie Skinner with um, Sherwood Rangers, who was the, who was the, the Padre there, who kept a lot of information. It's, a, it's an interesting thing without the work of the chaplains, we would we would be um a lot have a lot less information about these units in World War Two. Absolutely, and uh, everyone who was on the squadron in those early days talks about Lowry and how much he was beloved. Jim Rowlandson, one of the ground crew guys, said everyone liked him, but you know he would always have cigarettes available in in the crew rec room, but they were only for our crew. Because he and one of his ground crew buddies went to Lowry and said, hey, can we have some cigarettes? And he says, sorry, air crew only. But uh, if it wasn't for Lowry, a lot of photos um, would be lost of people who served on the squadron. Um, little details. It's amazing. And he had this beautiful hand scripted calligraphy that looked fabulous. I don't know mm. if it was him doing it or, you know, a clerk or whatever, but. Yeah, if it wasn't for him, there would be a lot of details lost about the squadron. And Norma Graham is asking, what was Larry's first name? Because she has an, a, a, she wants to get in touch with Ian Pegg from the independent company who's writing a book about World War II chaplains. So I think, uh, what, what's the, what the, the name? Oh, Larry. Oh. Well, is that, a, is that if I found the question you don't know? Yeah, it was going to come sooner or later. None yeah. of us are perfect. Well, well, sorry, I can't remember his specific first name, but, you know, if you... Uh, you send me a note. I can certainly, f uh, I do have it on file somewhere. No problem. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, put you in touch. GH were his initials. And I can dig up his name somewhere. I know I can. Super. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. Now, 429 Squadron, they were extremely hard on their COs. You know, um, your chances of surviving as a CO at 429 Squadron 
or not getting away unscathed were pretty slim, especially in the early days. Now, Wing Commander Owen, of course, was the first CEO, RAF type, career RAF type. Um, he never flew an operation on the squadron. As a matter of fact, um, I do have his uh, record, and he never actually flew operationally in the RAF ever. So it's kind of a mystery of why they made Wing Commander Owen the CO. Um, his initials, you can see, are JAP. So the the crews used to call him Jap or Jappy. The ones who didn't like him called him Jap. Hmm. The ones who liked him referred to him more affectionately as Jappy. Um, the Canadians, pretty well every Canadian on the squadron who served at that time that I spoke to, had nothing good to say about him. The British types who served said, yeah, he was okay. Mm. His only drawback, he never flew an op. He flew four second dicky trips, but he never flew his own crew on any operation. Now, he did lose a brother early in the war who was shot down and killed in 1940. His father was killed in uh, a bombing raid during the Blitz. And uh, he actually lost a second brother or, or his second brother was injured. So, you know, you can see he kind of had an aversion. Um, he wanted to survive the war, basically. Mm. Wow. I mean, there's no other way to put it. I, I actually spoke to two of his sons from his first marriage. And then after the war, he was divorced and married a second time. And had two more sons, and one was living in Australia and one in England. And as a result of me finding these two sets of sons, they eventually got connected. And um, they've all come to know each other from the two separate lives that Wing Commander Owen lived. You know, World, World War II and pre and post-World War II. And after he was posted out of 429 Squadron, he was never given another operational command either. Um, then of course, once he was posted out, there was a lot of controversy about why did Wing Commander Owen leave? You know, there were stories that he took off for an op and landed in Southern England somewhere. There was another story that, um, you know, uh, through the Padre net, they said, you know, Owen's bad for morale. He needs to be removed. Who knows? Who knows why he was posted out? But he, he did serve quite a while. He got them up to the operational level. But again, you know, they were dropping out of the sky like flies. In comes Wing Commander Savard, young guy, 22 years of age. Finished the tour on 425 Squadron, another Canadian squadron, Alouette Squadron, all French, because he's originally from Quebec. And he spoke with a French accent. And uh, one of the things he called everyone into the hangar when he took over, and he said, you work hard for me in his fr French accent, I'll work hard for you. And he immediately gained a lot of respect from everyone that was serving because he went out and he was flying ops. Okay. Now, unfortunately, the second op he flies in, he gets shot down and killed. His whole crew is lost. Wow. And he brought his original crew from four to five squadron, except for one person. One of the one of the guys on the crew took his tour and went off somewhere else. So he did get a replacement. But yeah, young fella, his father was a magistrate, you know, sat on the quarter king's bench in Quebec, you know, and uh, it's it's a bit of a sad story. So in comes and he's RCAF. OK, so he's also our first RCAFCO. So if we go to the next slide, in comes Wing Commander Pittington. Now Who he, has the moustache. He's clearly he's clearly got the attributes because he's got the moustache. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, <you know. laughs> absolutely. And he's he's what you call can RAF. He's a Canadian in the RAF because the RAF went around recruiting pilots, you know, uh, before the start of the war and early on in the war, you know, 1939-ish. He joined the RAF. He did a complete tour on another squadron, uh, you know, as well. So very experienced, very experienced. He comes in, 
takes over, and boom, killed on his third op. Okay, done. So we're talking in a time period of like two, three months. We've got three different CEOs on the squadron, right? From Owen to Savard to Piddington. And, of course, this is starting to affect morale as well. Well, uh, 30th July, in comes, you know, uh, Patterson. Now, Wing Commander Patterson, you look at him, this guy was actually a fighter pilot to begin with. And, you know, by this time of the war, the fighter pilots are running rhubarbs, and it's not like the Battle of Britain. And he's having difficulty with his CO, and he wants to go where the action is. So he switches over to bombers. He flies one complete tour on bombers. I believe it was 426 Squadron. And then they, uh, you know, promote him and say, okay, you're going to go in and take 429 Squadron. Now, this man single-handedly probably created the essence of 429 Squadron while he was there because he was the first long-term serving fighting CO. Um, he even did things like he stopped the authorization of the squadron crest, which was a boar's head approved under Wing Commander Owen. And he goes, no, 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 that's not Canadian. We're going to redo this all because it was ready to get signed off by the king then. And he goes, no, no, we're going to stop this. And he, uh, he has all the troops in the squadron um, put together different options for uh, the squadron crest. And then he has everyone vote on it and said, which one do you like the best? And, of course, everyone ended up choosing the one with the bison. Now, Wing Commander Owen, as far as the few people that were there during the time, don't remember him involving the squadron at all in the selection of the squadron crest. Mm. As a matter of fact, when the first version of the squadron crest was submitted, uh, Wing Commander Owen tried to put his family crest into the squadron crest. And, of course, the heraldry office says this hasn't been done since the time of Oliver Cromwell. Please resubmit. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, while you're on the subject of Owen again, David O'Keefe is asking you, there's a slight possibility that given all the death in his family, Owen may have been prohibited from going on operations. Have you looked into that? Yes. I was, And apparently there was even an order that he was not supposed to fly. Couldn't find anything. Okay, but again, the early part of the squadron, the ORB and what was filed and kept is incomplete. I mean, a lot of times they didn't even post when the air crews came in or anything. So it's hard to determine why he didn't fly ops. But he did okay. fly four second dicky operations. Right. And while it's, before it scroll goes back to on the list, Pat is asking... Were the 429 aircrew involved in the campaign to have all aircrew promoted to officer grade? Absolutely. They uh, Once they got into 6th Group, they were transferred there on 1 April 43. Promotions came fast and furious. Um, during the time it was in 4th Group, uh, promotions did happen to officer, but you're talking after about 12 to 15 ops. One crew, uh, Sergeant Stu Bruce, who was one of the first three Canadian crews posted to the squadron, was not promoted the entire time he was there, nor was anyone on his crew. And they they were the only crew to complete a full tour of, of 30 ops, including Bruce flew two more, a second, second Dickie, and no promotions. Apparently, Bruce and Owen didn't get along. And the one time I got to speak to Sergeant Stu Bruce, he said, Wing Commander Owen was the most violent and detested man on the squadron. So they they had something going on. I never got to talk to him again. He later died of cancer and, and never got any details of what exactly happened, what was going on. Mm, wow. That he would say that about Owen. Wow. Now, uh, more commanders. Well, let's go back to Patterson one little Sorry. bit. I, one I thing about, too, too quick flew, on the gun there. Yeah, he flew eight ops on the squadron, and they were all to German targets. That's, that's all he would fly. Um, interesting thing that happened to him, March 2nd, 44, a 427 squadron bomber there at Leeming at this time. 
because uh, uh, 427 and 429 shared the same base, is taxiing along, and somehow its bomb load drops on the taxi runway, and a whole bunch of incendiaries are there. And uh, the squadron engineering officer, McIntyre, was there, and Patterson, and they both ran there, and McIntyre is rolling the incendiaries off, and Patterson is kicking them off. And I talked to McIntyre, and, and uh, he says, I told Patterson not to kick them. They might go off, and guess what happens? He kicks one, boom, goes off, blows up. He thought Patterson was dead, but they managed to, you know, get him into the hospital and save him. And uh, McIntyre said, yeah, me and Patterson, we argued a lot all the time. He said, I went to visit him once in the hospital. All we did was argue, and he goes, I never talked to him again. Then in 1999, I was in Toronto and I visited Patterson's widow. And one of the first things she says to me is, he didn't kick that incendiary. It just blew up. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah. Um, so she was defending his honor, you know, even in 1999 about him. Wow. Incredible. Okay. Next slide. Yeah. Um, so what we're looking at here, we've got, Del Kenny takes over as acting CEO. He was never actually made the CEO. Everyone thought he was going to become the CEO. He was expecting it. He had also done another tour in another squadron. He, uh, you know, he ended up with the DFC and bar. He ended up with the Air Force Cross, uh, second tour. Um, and then, lo and behold, they post in Alavant. And uh, Del Kenny was extremely upset he wasn't made the CEO. All the air crew knew about it, uh, so it, he must have been quite vocal about it. Uh, they all said he did everything possible to get as many of his trips in so he could be posted out, but I could find no evidence of that. He did his regular trips uh, the way he was supposed to as a flight commander. Uh, funny little story, uh, at one point while well, Del Kenny was acting CEO, um, he was waiting to hear how many planes would be operational for the op that was coming up that night. And he kept calling down to the flight line, how many, how many? And Don Ross, who was a crew chief of uh, one of the dispersal units, um, he got sick and tired of running back and forth answering this phone from Del Kenny. And uh, he responds to Del and says, you know, when they're ready, I'll goddamn well tell you. <laughs> How many, you know, and, and Del Kenny comes over the phone and says, do you know who this is? And and uh, Don Ross said, of course I do. And then Don goes, do you know who this is? And Del Kenny says, no. And Don Ross says, good. And he slammed the phone down, ran back to his dispersal. And within five minutes, Del Kenny came racing down in his staff car to look for the guy who was on the phone. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Funny little story. Funny, funny, funny. stuff. <laughs> so Alavant gets posted in as, as the next CEO. And again, he's on his second tour. And uh, he's 21 years old as a wing commander. Youngest wing commander in the RCAF. And I think when he made group commander, he was still 21 or he was just freshly like 22 years of age. Can you imagine a 21 year old now being responsible for the lives of 500 people in a bomber squadron? Uh, I mean, it, it, it came out, it was a shock when the, when it was 22 earlier and now it's 21. <laughs> and it's just everybody who's watching this of a certain age is thinking what they, as you said, what they were capable of when they were 20 or 21 or even 30 and this it's it's insane it's yeah. insane what these guys are, were doing and you can also see in now levant here he doesn't he looks way older than 21 yeah you know and uh, of course safar does still look his age even though he's already flown a tour and that was one thing a lot of guys said they were shocked at how young savard looked but here's alavant he's 21 he, he earns the only DSO in the squadron's history during the war. And the reason it was never recorded as being a DSO awarded to the squadron because 
when the base commander flew, uh, filled in the forms for his recommendation and citation, they put 427 squadron on it. Because 427 was also serving at Leeming at the time. You know, so it's amazing no one caught that. So it was a clerical error. And, of course, what happens to Alavon? He goes up to do a flight test one day, takes a non-flying flight engineer who didn't know he had to switch the tanks because he only put so much fuel in each of the tanks, you know, especially for takeoff. Then you had to switch the main tanks right away. And within minutes of getting off the ground, it crashes. And Alavant's pulled out of the wreckage, so is the flight engineer. They both survive. But Alavant finishes his tour in a body cast with the squadron, and then he's rotated out in October of 44. So, you know, so here we have two killed, two injured, right? One denied promotion. And then we have Wing Commander Bullduck. Whoa, gee, something happened there. We, we have someone's email by mistake. Now, Wing Commander Bullduck, interesting fellow. He gets posted in with his, uh, with his crew. He's quickly promoted within weeks to be flight commander. He flies a total of 31 ops on 429 Squadron. Now, 10 of them as the CO. But, uh, you know, so he was brought up, you can say, through the ranks in the squadron the whole time. And he basically takes them um, almost to the end of the war, you know, 9th April of 45. And uh, next slide. I think that's that's it basically for the wartime CEOs. Okay, so in, as we kind of got a, uh, in between subjects, Trent Talenko is asking, when 421 Bison squad, uh, Squadron got the Halifax, did they get either H2S radars or jammers to operate? And are there any records of window and chaff drops? I think basically window and chaff started from uh, the raid on Hamburg in the summer of 43, and they were dropping them out basically all the time. And yes, they did get H2S on the squadron as well. One interesting thing Wing Commander Patterson did is uh, the weakest part, most vulnerable part of the bomber, of course, was coming from underneath, which, you know, the German knife fighters would do. He removed the H2S out of there and put a machine gun in there, and they put a mattress on, on, on the aircraft, and they had an underbelly gunner that would lie on that mattress and, and watch for night fighters and engage them if they happened. Now, apparently this was his own innovation. It wasn't actually a turn. And I talked to a couple of guys that were on the squadron, and he said, yep, we put a mattress down, we laid on it, and we looked around. And I said, could you see anything? He says, oh, yeah, it was really good. It was really handy. And um, I said, so why didn't you continue with it? He goes, I don't know. Hmm. <laughs> well, that's an that's a, that's a honest answer. <laughs> Canadian innovation, you know. Yeah. So All right. We're off to Kiel. Right. Um, so – Let's uh, let's head to the next slide here. Where are we? Oh, oh, back up. Sorry. Well, back up. Yeah. Oh, here we are. Here we are. These are the first three crews that were posted onto the squadron um, um, when it was formed. On the left there is Sergeant Stu Bruce's crew, the only crew to complete a, a full tour in the Wellington period. Um, at the top here, we have uh, Lancaster's crew. Um, he, the pilot Lancaster is uh, an RAF type. And on the extreme right is Manuel Rabinovich, air gunner. He changed his name to Raber after the war. Uh, we'll come back to him with a little story. And on the bottom right is Frenchy de Buzac's crew, uh, who was also lost on the night uh, on the op to Krefeld. He's the one that bid on the bombs. And interestingly enough is... Uh, uh, wireless operator Paul Matier. I met his niece lives 20 kilometers away from me here in Edmonton. So I was I was just shocked to meet and talk with someone mm. who lost a, a member on 429 the same night as my uncle. It's rather surprising. 
Yeah. So yeah, let's talk about fact versus fiction. Uh, one thing I found with talking to these guys is sometimes the stories they told me didn't mesh with the information I had that was in the ORB, for example. You know, uh, several of the crew members published their own stories, like, um, you know, Eric Stouffer, Unsafe for Air Crew. He was a fl Canadian flight engineer. Um, Eric Lapham, who was a RAF navigator on the squadron. He was also shot down on the night of the Krefeld op. He became a POW. And, you know, like Neil Hamilton, who was a bomb aimer. And, um, you know, it's funny. In his book, he says, yeah, we flew like nine or 11 ops over Germany. It was hell. It was terrible. It was everything. And in the ORB, they only flew two ops before they were posted out to North Africa. So, you know, one of the big things was figuring out fact from fiction. So uh, April 4th of 43, the Kiel Op, Manny uh, Rabinovich published his own memoirs called M Manny Goes to War. And in it, he said, on that op, they took two Royal Artillery types who were going, co going to study the flak at Kiel. And they flew over the target, dropped their bombs, and then, you know, the uh, the RAF uh, or the Royal Artillery officer said, I say, can we go around again? And they said no and left. Now, interestingly enough, in the ORB, there's no record of this happening. And Manny mm. uh, told me, Wing Commander Owen, Owen never flew an op. He made us wear our ties when we flew on op, which isn't true. Um, and, you know, I said, uh, you know, I called him up one day. I said, uh, you know, Manny, I, uh, the ORB, I checked for that day. It said Wing Commander Owen was flying second Dickey in your aircraft. And the, it doesn't say anything about two Royal Artillery types that were uh, along for the ride. I go, so that would have made eight people in that bomber flying on that op. He goes, no way Owen was with us. He never flew an op. I go, well, the ORB says he did. And he goes, no, no, that can't be right. And he goes, I'll check my logbook and get back to you. He never did. He died. But he donated his logbook and uh, the wireless operator Bowles' logbook to the Leftbridge archives in Leftbridge, Alberta. I got copies of the... The, both their logbooks, and there's no mention of Royal Artillery officers in their plane, but it says Wing Commander Owen flying second Dickey. So it's like, okay, spy op at its best, never recorded, don't know. So I left that story in in the book, and, you know, I mentioned that there's no record of these two Royal Artillery officer types, so leave it up to you if it's true or not. Right. Yeah. No. The, the, as David O'Keefe said, you, you are demonstrating the the trials and tribulations of being a historian. You know, conflicting information, accounts you can't fully corroborate. These are part and parcel of of, of the work people, many of my guests do on a daily basis. It's just you, there are no easy answers. Everything isn't completely in black and white, unfortunately. Absolutely. And it's like Eric Stouffer's. You know, he wrote this book called Unsafe for Air Crew. And he was a flight engineer and he lists all these ops he's flying on and he's describing them in, in a lot of detail, including one where they had one of the Halifaxes with the modified underbelly turn. The ORB doesn't match up with half of the flights he talks about in this book. Wow. So is he relating his story or stories of other people that were on the squadron? Hard to determine, right? Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah. moving along. Moving along. Now, Flight Sergeant Broughton here. The reason why uh, I, I included this is look at his photo here. This is his official RAF photo on graduation with his wings, and normally the deadpan face, yeah. you know, standing there. And he's standing there with his hands on his hip, looking entirely different from anyone else ever. And, you know, I'm like, huh, what's this all about? So, um, you know, he was posted into the squadron in March of 43, flew two ops, 
one in April, and then in May, the the crew he's with, they were shot down and killed. But on his first op, uh, you know, he's a rear gunner, and he spots a JU-88 about 200 yards out. Now, the reason why he spotted it is it had a red light on, <laughs> you know. Sometimes the German knife fighter pilots wouldn't turn off all their landing lights. So he opens fire. Uh, one of the engines on the JU-88 catches fire. It disappears into the night. They successfully evade. They go on, bomb, come back. Everything's good. Now, Six Group would review all the air combat reports, and they would send them out to all the squadrons, to, you know, the gunnery leaders. And what they wrote about this one is, you know, great determination and skill between the pilot and the rear gunner to evade this aircraft. And it shows the bomber will prevail, you know, and all that good stuff. But, of course, you know, what they failed to mention was, yeah, and it helps when the German night fighters leave their landing lights on because then you can spot them more easily, right? Mm. So next slide. So what about what happened with with good old Douglas here? You know, um, looking into his file, the great thing about Ancestry.ca is um, if you play, pay for the premium membership, they have short versions of all the files of every serviceman that was killed in World War II online. And that helps a lot with the research. It helped immensely with the research. And that's what made it more difficult for the RAF types because, of course, uh, you know, their records are in Hendon in, um, in England, and only next to King can re request the files. So if, if you're wondering when you're reading information in the book why there isn't a lot about the RAF types, it's because I couldn't get the info, right? Mm. So, you know, here's a brief bio of him. His father's suffering from shell shock from World War I. His mother didn't want him to join up. Uh, he spent three years in the army to begin with, like he joined in 1939. He joined underage. And like a lot of guys that joined the army first, they were sitting around, bored, doing nothing. They wanted to get in the action before the war ended. So a lot of them joined the RCAF. Many of them were, were that case. He gets selected for pilot training when he's in ITS. So he goes through his elementary flying training, passes. Then he gets to his secondary flying training, and suddenly they say he's nervous, he lacks judgment, and they fail him up. And they send him to observer training. Now, uh, you know, I'll tell you, the I, I'm reading these course reports of his, and I'm just shocked at the wording they're putting in. You know, like they say, no backbone, dull type, a little bit of a show off that, and a little bit of a show off. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, we can see that bit. Yeah, we can see that there. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Right. Acts, it doesn't act on his own initiative. His mind doesn't work quickly enough to be an air navigator. He should never have been made an air navigator. And they send him to air gunnery school instead. Now, I was in the military for 10 years. I wrote a lot of course reports running courses and you to put words like that and descriptions like that in someone's course report is very damaging very mm. very damaging to that person's career so when i read that i was just shocked at, at this it's like what happened what was going on during his training that his course officer just was so fed up with this guy that he wrote all this stuff, right? And again, there's, that's a question that can't be answered because, you know, there's no one you can find that can, uh, that can fill you in. And that's actually something I did. We have the Royal Canadian Legion magazine here, and I was trying to find someone who may have trained with my uncle, John Kopchuk, and I posted yeah. in Lost Trails. Does any, anyone out there ever know John Kopchuk? And, this guy from Victoria calls me, Jerry Walls, and he says, yeah, I met your uncle when we boarded the train in Regina, and, and we went all the way through our training, all the way through to air observer training and graduation. I knew him the whole time. And then I could ask him questions. 
what went on here? What went on yeah. there? What what was going on? But unfortunately, all we have what is what's in the official file for this guy now. But interestingly, the crew he was posted in with, he never flew with on an op. And he flew his two ops, he flew with different crews. So he was obviously in the, the pool yeah. of you know, unassigned air crew that would fill in. So for some reason, he was divorced from his initial crew. Don't know but, why. But, but what's fascinating and, and rather upsetting is that his entire legacy in terms of this, his, his, the written word about him is this negative report written 80 plus years ago. And yet there's a guy who was killed in action for his country. And yet the historical legacy is something so damning. Now, obviously, to defend the guy who wrote that, he wasn't realizing that in 80 years' time that might be all that's written about this guy. But it is fascinating that that, that's, that document is pretty much the only source you have about this, this individual. And there must be a story behind it. But you, as you said, you don't know the story. Yes. And then, you know, again, trying to find relatives and everything else. And they might not know the story either, right? Yeah, exactly. Or, or, or have a different version of it and the truth be somewhere between the two. But no, it, it's fascinating. It, it, it just raises this this question of wh when do you stop with this research? Do you do you not put the story in the book because you can't you can't complete it? Do you leave? Do you? It's it's a fascinating um, problem to, to dilemma to, to to deal with, I guess. But we should move on because there's lots more to talk about, and I'm really enjoying it. No, oh, okay, <laughs> great. Uh... You know, I was noticing as I was putting this together that there were so many unhappy stories where, where the person ends up killed, right? Yeah. So I thought, okay, I got to find a, a happier story here. So here we have uh, Flying Officer uh, Duncan McNaughton. He's posted into the squadron 6 May of 44. Now he's 33 years of age at this point. Now, the and he flew 20 ops in total. Um, on the squadron before he was posted out with his crew, they went to 405 squadron, which was the Canadian Pathfinder squadron. Um, when in 1932, he was in the Summer Olympics in Los Angeles representing Canada at age 21, and he won the gold medal in the high jump. Now, he was actually quite an accomplished high jumper. You know, he had participated in the then empire games and various canadian competitions but he was going to school university in los angeles so of course he was automatically selected for the canadian team because they wouldn't have to pay for his trip to los angeles <laughs> <laughs> and he wins a gold medal and the thing is canada didn't win another gold medal in the high jump until 2016 Wow. You know, so he had that record for upwards of 80 years, you know, and and he stayed in the States after the war. You know, he got his bachelor's, got his Ph.D. You know, he ended up in the Canadian Olympic Hall of Fame, B.C. Sports Hall of Fame, Cornwall Hall of Fame. Um, and there's an annual grant awarded to him by the American Association of Petroleum Geologists in his name that was started, you know, as by his widow after he died. Um, you know, so he was, uh, you know, earned his DFC as well. And, of course, he was uh, one of the people photographed with uh, the Thousand Sortie bomb mm -hmm. operation here. They must have taken about 10 pictures. McNaughton's in the middle there, you know, and uh, – one of the things I know when I talk to a lot of the guys in the squadron um, who were there later in the war, and they all go, you know, we had Olympic gold medalists on the squadron. So I had to make sure I included a story about McNaughton. Simply uh, and it's, and it's a good one. And you're right. It's good to have a positive one because you know, the people watching this, if you know anything about Bomber Command and 8th Air Force, the losses were just terrible. I mean, it, it's so there there are probably a lot, of, uh, a lot more sad stories and there are happy ones, which – brings us rather neatly to our next uh, uh, sad story. Yeah. Well, this is, uh, again, Flying Officer Patterson. He got caught up early in the war. He ended up staying in Canada, training pilots. You know, a lot of them, when the, they joined early on, they wanted to come overseas. But, of course, um, 
you know, the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan needed a lot of pilots. So a lot of these guys got held back. He had huge amounts of flying experience by the time he finally got overseas. Now he's on his second op to Berlin, killed in a mid-air collision, you know, and the whole crew was killed except for the rear gunner. Now, the interesting thing about this crew, uh, Ayers, who is third from the right, was actually an American. He had served in the United States Navy from 1937 to 41, um, knew there was war coming, came north, you know, like a lot of other Americans, joined the RCAF. He was a radio man in, uh, and a petty officer first class when he left the Navy. And of course, what's he become in the R in the Royal Canadian Air Force, but the wireless operator air gunner, right? Yeah. Um, so he's part of that crew. Now, the reason why I wanted to include this one is the night Patterson and his crew uh, are killed. His mother is at home and she has a, a dream where her son appears to her, Pattison, in all his flight gear. And he says, I have to go now, Mom. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and she was so distraught. She didn't want to go out that day. Her husband stayed home from work to console her, and what arrives later in the day. Telegram saying, your son is lost on operations. Wow. And those are pictures of his aircraft, the the wreckage, you know, where, where they crashed. It just, yeah. it was bone chilling. You know, the, um, mm. his, uh, a member of his family did all the research on him and sent it to me. You know, just his story alone, he must have wrote about 120, 130 pages. And when I read that part about his mother having that dream, it just sent chills. You know, and mm -hmm. of course, you know, I can imagine all the families that got telegrams, not just 429 Squadron, but anyone who served in the war. Even my own grandmother and grandfather, they, they denied that John was killed in the war. They said he... When the war was done, he went and moved to Ukraine and lived there for the rest of his life. Wow. You and know? that's why I, I bring people like you on the channel, Greg, because YouTube is full of people where it's all about the aircraft models. It's all about the change of turret design between November and December. It's all about the you know the, the suspension bridge change that happened. And it's all interesting, that stuff. But what at the heart of this is people. It's people and the loss and sacrifice and, and you know, I... Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of lost for words, but I can't be because I've got to carry on hosting the show. So, uh, you know, thanks for sharing that, Greg. Really important stuff. Yeah, and, and you know, it's a case we won the war, but we still lost. Yeah. You know, and, and here's seven crew members right here, five with my uncle, you know, 395 men in 429 Squadron, you know, 10,000 Canadians in Bomber Command, over 55,000 thousand air crew and bomber command total you know and let's not let's not count everyone else that died you know in the war and and the tragedy every family felt when they got that telegram you know mm, absolutely yeah i know and people love people are, people are loving it and and sympathetic at the same time um incredible stuff uh, next slide are we moving on Next slide. Yeah. So this is a famous slide uh, picture of one of our Halifax bombers, LW-127. And if you look very closely, you will see the starboard tail fin is missing. Mm -hmm. Now, this is obviously a bomb site photo from the aircraft above. What happened yep. was this, this they were flying uh, Mondeville. Aircraft above them releases a bomb. The mid-upper gunner says, oh, my God, there's a bomb coming for us. Knocks off the tail fin. Aircraft goes into a spin. 
Four of them get out. Three die in the crash. And the almost everyone in the squadron was, witnessed this. It was a daylight op, and it just horrified everyone who saw it. Because, you know, you always heard the stories of, well, there were mid-air collisions, you know, did bombs, you know, hit other aircraft, because they were all flying at different altitudes. Um, and, and they were flying at night, so most of the time they couldn't see what was happening. Here was a daylight op, boom, knocks the tail fin off, they go in spinning, and three of the crew are killed. Four survived the war, and they all stayed in contact, of course. One of them sex successfully evaded capture. The other three became POWs for the rest of the war. You know, but again, perfect example of something that can happen with the crowded airspace over the target. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, well, moving on, Anderson crew. Yeah, so here we are there. They're doing part of, you know, supporting the troops on the ground during the Normandy invasion. Uh, they're flying in. Anderson gets hit by a piece of shrapnel from flak, goes through, you know, his waist. He starts bleeding, and he orders the crew to bail out. Three of the crew bail out, end up POWs for the rest of the war. Now, the flight engineer um, steers decides, no, I can fly the plane back to England. So, you know, he he tries to wrestle Anderson out of, out of the cockpit because Anderson's quite large. He's like 200 pounds. Um, and then, you know, he's he also gets on the intercom, the two uh, gunners that are still left, Mangione and Richie. Mangione was the mug. And says, hey, I think I can fly this plane back. So they go forward to try and help him. And, you know, I spoke to Richie and Mangione both about this. And they said there was just blood everywhere, you know. And they were slipping and sliding everywhere because, you know, blood is like, you know, walking on grease. There's no friction. And, and he said, you know, they decided what they would do was, you know, um, get his parachute harness on and uh, throw him out of the back of the plane, and then hopefully, you know, the Germans could take care of him and tend to his wounds. And, you know, Richie said it took them over an hour between the two of them to wrestle Anderson all the way to the back of the plane. Um, by the time they got back there, they were over England. Uh, of course, you know, they, uh, you know, sent him out of the plane, parachute deploys, Anderson's body was later found. Of course, he was dead. Um, they get back to Leeming, and, uh, you know, they, they're told, no, no, don't try and land this plane, because Steer says, you know, I can land this plane. I can land it. And they said, no way. So they said, fly it out to, over the water, and the three of you bail out. So they bail out. Uh, Steers is, uh, uh, you know, decorated with a CGM. Mangione and Richie are given DFMs uh, by the king when the king comes to visit in August of 44. And the other three crew members were extremely upset that they bailed out and they spent the rest of the war in the POW camp. You know, I talked to Banning about it, uh, who was the wag, and he said, yeah, yeah I was really pissed off. <laughs> wow. so, they didn't get a ride home. So... And Incredible one of the guys, Eric, Eric Stouffer, actually said after that incident, he said when he saw, uh, you know, um, Steers, who was also a flight engineer, he goes, I don't remember him being that gray. He said he seemed like his hair turned gray overnight as a result of that incident. Good grief. Yeah. Wow. And, of course, the last one. Um, here we are. Uh, the crew did an op. They all got diver diverted to Spilsby because of weather over Leeming. And uh, they were all parked, uh, you know, on, on the tarmac, uh, you know, out of the way. And it was, uh, I believe it was 207 Squadron. I can't remember the other squadron. They were taking off for an op the next day. Um, the one fellow, you know, his name I can't, it eludes me. It's in the book. Um, 
gunned his Lancaster to take off. It spun or, you know, uh, swerved to the left and went crashing into the 429 Halifaxes that were parked on the side of the runway. Eventually, three of the planes, uh, three of the 429 Halleys blew up and exploded. P.O. Platt, along with uh, an engineering officer from the base, tried to get into one of the Halleys to try and move, start it up and move it out of the way. But one of the explosions, um, some shrapnel went flying, hit Platt in the shoulder, and he later died from his wounds. He was nominated for a George Cross, but it got downgraded all the way to an MID. Not sure why or what for or what can be done about it, but, you know, it's interesting. I was talking to some of the crews. They go, yeah, we were in the base theater watching a movie when all of a sudden we heard all these explosions, you know, the 429 guys, and they go, they come running out and boom. So a bunch of them had to take the bus back to Leeming, of course, and uh, – and the squadron carried on. But mm. we lost Platt that day in three aircraft on the ground. Well, yeah. And it, that, that amazing aspect of someone downgrading medals. I mean, it happens all the time. It happens in the Army. You know, these obviously went across the desks of people. And someone said, yeah, no, yeah, no, that's not quite brave enough. And just dropped it down one. I, I understand not everybody can get the top awards you, you have to have some system and not everything you know doing your job doesn't necessarily require any kind of uh, gallantry award for it but it, i wonder what went through the minds of people who were downgrading these things it's just it's just an odd situation to be that kind of person and, and go yeah yeah no not quite brave enough and drop it down one it's just human psychology is interesting well, a couple of the guys on the squadron used to say uh, they would rather hand out promotions and leave rather than give you a decoration because the guys who approved the decorations were usually flat tops with yeah. no operational wings and no fruit salad on, on their chest. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know how oh. true that is, but that's what some of the guys said, right? Of course, yeah. Well, we've got one slide to go, and we'll do a couple of questions. Yep. Target tokens, something unique to six group. If it was determined by the intelligence section that your bombs hit the aiming point of the target, uh, you were awarded a target token in three days leave. So um, only six group did this sort of thing. And, of course, everyone in the crew would be presented with one of these certificates. But, of course, they were more happy they got three days leave with it as well. Sometimes a bottle of, uh, you know, uh, cognac or whiskey or something was handed out as well. Yep. And well, I think that's all we have. <laughs> well, I mean, it's been amazing. We've, we've done an hour and a half. We'll just do a couple of questions and then, and then basically we'll invite you back to another one at some other point, because I feel we've only um, tapped a, a small percentage of the uh, of the stories that you 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 put to paper and, and obviously you're still learning but we've got a question from david o'keefe so in greg's opinion what is still the greatest mystery associated with the squadron oh uh, david if i answer that question i'm going to give away the whole story of your next book ah uh, he must have <laughs> known that he must have known that uh, for those of us who do know what greg uh, david david's working on but yeah go, I'll, I'll let you answer it well, uh, the great mystery, uh, uh, one of the crews, Robert Conroy's crew, during the Wellington period went down. Um, everyone in the crew was killed but uh, Conroy. He was a Canadian guy. He successfully evades back to England, gets all the way back to England. They send him to leave to Canada, and then... They post them right back to 429 Squadron. Now, normally, if you were shot down and, and successfully evaded, they would put you in a different theater of operation. And that actually happened to one other pilot, Milne. He was uh, shot down during the Wellington period, successfully evaded, sent him to Southeast Asia, and he was killed in a crash in April of 45. So Conroy ends up right back at 429, flying ops, and then one, uh, someone from Six Group sends a memo down to Patterson and says, you know, if you recommend this guy for an award, we'll probably approve it. 
you know, because he's successfully evaded, made it back to England. And um, Patterson writes back in a memo and says, you know what? I can't recommend this man for an award until we investigate what happened with the downing of his crew and why it is he got out and none of his crew got out. The pilot's supposed to be the last man out of the plane. So he wrote this memo in like January or February of 44. Conroy goes on an op to Berlin, I believe it is. He takes with him the B flight commander, who is a navigator, squadron leader Bell. And that's the only non-pilot flight commander that was in the squadron. So he takes a... Uh, he takes Bell with him. He takes Matt McIntyre, the squadron uh, engineering leader, and he also took the wireless operator engineering uh, or, or leader with him as well. And I can't remember the name. It escapes me right offhand. They go on this op. They get attacked. The plane's going down, right? Conroy had also survived a takeoff crash at the start of the Battle of the Ruhr, but his navigator was killed. So he's in a crash, he gets shot down and evaded, and now he's in a halley, they're spinning down to the ground. McIntyre, you know, went to get his parachute for him, and just then, and I talked to McIntyre about this as well, and I said, you know, how come everyone got out of the plane but Conroy? And he goes, well, I went to get his chute, the plane took a nosedive and it sent me flying through the nose of the aircraft. I crashed through the perplex glass and, you know, then I deployed my chute, of course, and Conroy was left in the plane without a chute, crashes, he dies. And so it's like, what happened to Conroy? How did he manage to escape out of the first aircraft when his crew didn't? You know, Patterson sends this email not an email, sorry, they didn't have yeah. a memo, back to group and says, we need an investigation before I recommend them. And before all that happens, he's killed. Well, David O'Keefe is sitting giggling in the background because he knows a little bit more about something, but we'll we'll leave that for another day. And remind people that the links to your book in the description below. And uh, it's been fascinating talking to you, Greg. And uh, it, you've done everything you're supposed to do. You've told a story. You've, you've kept it about the people. Uh, you could have just done a list, did all the, the dimensions of the runway and how many floor tiles there are in the officer's mess. And it would have been boring information. So you've given us the, the, the story of people, which is fantastic. And, and, and that's what we've loved. So I'm just going to take you off screen for a second. Remind people what we've got coming up to. And I'll bring you back in a moment. Say goodbye. So, folks, we have a first time a guest again tomorrow. Megan Hamilton, who Brad assures me is a rising star in Canadian history, is coming on to talk about men and morale, the training of the Canadian Army. This is before they're going to combat, kind of mostly in, in Canada and the UK prior to D-Day. So I'm really looking forward to speaking to Megan. She's actually in Britain at the moment, but she's joining us tomorrow. And then we have Ted Barris on Thursday. Who, what's not like to not, not to like there? Ted Barris talking about the Royal Canadian Navy. And then onwards and upwards, lots more shows coming your way. But I'm going to bring Greg back in to say thank you very much, as I have again. So thanks very much, Greg. Did you enjoy talking to a bunch of people? Obviously, yes, I really did. And I, I love the fact I'm now included with esteemed historians like David O'Keefe. You can name Greg. drop a few people now, <laughs> and, and people will be name dropping you as well. You know, they'll say, "Oh, I was on with Greg that time." He was. It's it, we're all we're all somewhere on the league table of of celebrity historian fame. Uh, some of us are lower than others. Some of us are higher than others. But it's fantastic. So, Greg, uh, uh, we'll leave it there. Uh, it's been great talking to you, and and folks, I will see you all again tomorrow with Megan Hamilton. So, thanks for your attention. Thanks for your questions. It's Paul for World War II TV checking out. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye.